my drama. What were our top choices this time around, starting with Top Dog Underdog by Suzanne Laurie Parks? Take it away, Benjamin Laufer. The revival of Top Dog Underdog takes place at the Golden Theater through January 15th, marking its 20-year anniversary. This revival is timely as it addresses the American Black male experience. Top Dog Underdog follows the story of two brothers named Booth and Lincoln, much like the former president who emancipated enslaved Black individuals in the United States and his assassin. The characters were jokingly named by their father. And spoiler alert, with characters named like them, we can almost predict how the show would end with Booth. It's like Death of a Salesman. The title kind of gives it, you know, the characters give it away. So what do you think the significance of their names being Booth and Lincoln are, Eva? Well, I, I, like I said, I mean, I don't know. And I don't care that the father had a weird sense of humor. While both characters are always living on the edge, they're ready to be easily set off at a moment's notice. This comes from their hustler instincts to trust no one and to try to cut corners to get ahead, often through their practice of a three-car Monte scam. The two standout elements of the production for me were the music and the lighting. The theater playlist has been applauded by Billboard magazine and curated by sound designer Justin Ellington, featuring R&B, and hip-hop hits, the playlist is a vibrant contrast to the darkness of the show itself. The lighting dramatically engulfs the two characters as they descend into hell in the final scene and helps the audience adjust initially when the curtain is first lifted. The show takes place entirely in one seedily furnished apartment belonging to Booth. Much like Shakespeare, the focus is always on the two characters and not the backdrop. Leaning on the strength of one another, the two leads, Yaha Abdul Manteen II and Corey Hawking's masterful performance, carry the audience through the emotional roller coaster of Booth and Lincoln's complicated relationship. If you're left wondering anything from the show, it may be, what does it mean to be brothers? I give this production a mixed face for the strength of its performance and for the dark themes and content. I, I saw the original was at the public. Um, I think it had it was funny about the music because they had a uh, they had a a, a, a singer in it. Um, Moss Def. This time around, it just didn't do anything for me. It's a rather claustrophobic play because you're stuck in this room and they they're stuck in this rut, and this guy is just obsessed with being the best Monty player ever. He wants to be better than his brother, but his brother is the best. And also, this guy is like you know is wants to get his girl back and keeps trying to get his girl back and they they steal a bunch of stuff and I mean they're not the most pleasant of characters and we're stuck with them and we know how it's sort of going to turn out so I mean you know it's going to turn out a certain way but it's like how is it going to turn out so I guess it's the how that keeps it interesting but ah, I'm just going to give this a mixed face I wasn't I wasn't as excited by it as I was originally in Bruce Norris's downstate, four registered sex offenders are living in a contemporary group home downstate Illinois, about 280 miles from Chicago. They all have rather different history. Red was a piano teacher who molested two of his students about 30 years ago. He's now in a wheelchair and seems kind of pathetic. Uh, young guy, uh, Joe, had an affair with a 14-year-old girl when he was about 30-something. Um, Felix had sex with his own daughter. He now wants to go and visit his sister, but he's really not supposed to go out of state. And the social worker suspects that he's been communicating with his daughter. And there's another guy, D, who's like um, really kind of together now and sort of takes care of Fred and arranges things. But he had um, sex with a young boy uh, years ago. It's sort of amazing that none of these offenders feel much shame or, you know, like, um, or any guilt about what they've done, but, um, but we do feel some sympathy for them now because they're not allowed to use phones. They're not allowed to. 
yourself. I have no bloody sympathy for any of them. I bloody hated this play. They were disgusting uh-huh. people. And how dare you even try to manipulate me into feeling sorry for these awful, terrible people. And it's like, yeah, and the, and the victim is being victimized again like he's a bad guy when he's really not. One of the boys who was molested by Fred is now um, confronting him and oh, I thought you said something. No, I didn't say that. Um, and he's a main character himself because he's the one who really helps us understand just how damaging this is. While if we didn't meet him, we would have considerably more sympathy, or at least I would have. Yeah, you would. Be because balanced by a really damaged person whose life, um, you know, he's married, he has a kid, but he's still very um, destroyed by that experience from 30 years ago. And, and D, and D, I mean, D, D is just this troublemaker. I, I, he's just constantly, everything, every, he causes all the damage that happens in this play. I mean, I just, I know people, I don't know why anyone, I mean, Bruce Norris, he wrote one good play, Clybourne Park. The rest of his plays are all nasty sex stories that are just, I don't, ugh. This is, well, this is a sex major, story, but it's also about, major, yeah. major ick factor. Yeah, but it's really very much about how much punishment do these people deserve? As and, much as possible. Okay, well, again, I guess I was able to find more sympathy for them. I still wouldn't want them to be living across the street from the priest. Anyway, this gets a major, 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 major unhappy face. It's like, do not bother seeing this piece of dreck. I thought it was a good play. I gave it a happy face. Hello, we are here with a very special guest who is going to be presenting a special Latina Christmas special at the Soho Playhouse. So please tell us all about it. It sounds exciting. I'm Diana Yanez. Well, Latina Christmas special has been running since 2013, which is when we first started it. It's basically a hybrid comedy show slash um, play. Um, It's written and performed by three comedians. I'm one of them. I'm Diana Yanez. We have Maria Russell and Sandra Valls. All three of us are some somewhat accomplished comedians, but we're also actors. And um, the special is actually kind of an homage to the television specials we grew up watching, where uh, we, we, you know, we watched them and we, we so identified with, you know, White Christmas and, and Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer and, and, and all of the specials. I was a big fan of Donnie Marie Show and all that stuff. But our families were very different. We were, we're all Hispanic Americans. We're of different heritages. I'm Cuban American. Uh, Sandra is uh, Mexican American, but from Laredo, Texas, a border town. So very different from Maria, who's half Mexican and half Lithuanian. Uh, all three of us were born in the United States and raised here, raised on television and, and uh, consider ourselves American. But the show is about walking that fine line between the culture we identify with and the culture of our parents. And there's this beautiful sort of middle ground that is um, what we talk about in the show. So it's, the play is three women who get together and are having a little Christmas gathering, sharing photos and stuff and drinking tequila. And one by one, each of us gets up and does a mini one woman show about our Christmases growing up. So what are the different tweaks that you have? Because it sort of made me think of the Sephardic Jews and the Ashkenazi Jews. We're all Jewish, but we all have different customs. And we kind of argue about, well, our custom's better than your custom. And, oh, I like your custom because then I don't have to do my custom. So is it the same way? Well, what's kind of interesting about it is uh, we, as I said, we've been doing the show for a while and it, it sells out regularly. We have a big fan following. And people come see it over and over again. They bring more and more family members. What I find interesting about it is that people, no matter what background they are, they come, they see the show and they go, oh, I've had people come up to me and say, I didn't realize how 
Latino, my family is, you know, in the sense that, and these are from Jewish American uh, fans and Chinese American fans. And, you know, we have fans of all types. And what I find interesting about it is, yes, we talk a lot about the differences between our cultures. And in fact, that's a constant conversation between the three of us as friends anyway. Uh, but the universalness of the show is that any high stakes holiday, any high stakes holiday is going to have its family dramas. It's gonna <laughs> have your, in fact, that's one of the things I like to say about it. If you've ever had a parent, you will relate because it's very much about our relationship with our parents as children and then as adults. You know, it doesn't even have to be family drama. I'm having a friend's anniversary and just trying to figure out where we all could eat and be happy. Like, you know, I want sushi. I want this. And we ended up on Korean barbecue. I mean, you know. <laughs> Sounds like me and my friends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, absolutely. So it's sort of like people keep going on about diversity, but diversity turns out to be, like you said, universal. It's relatable. Yeah. Everything is relatable. So it's like, we're not really all that different. Correct. And in fact, I think that uh, it's always been kind of a, a, a plan in the back of my mind, certainly not at the forefront, but I always thought that by telling our stories, we would um, find our, 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 our connection. Basically, we're all human beings. So we all have our fears. We all have our grief. We all have our our joys, you know, I, I, I feel like our telling each other our stories, we better understand each other. And I would say that about any culture. If you talk to someone who is completely different from you, someone from Africa or from Korea or, or someone who's Jewish American, or it, it doesn't matter. If we start talking about what, what it is to be human, our stories always connect. And if I don't know your story personally, like I don't know what it's like to, I don't know, skydive, you're telling me about what it feels like will be like as if I was experiencing it. So what inspired you to get this all together in the first place? One reason is a little selfish. I had a one woman show called um, Viva La Evolucion, which was about growing up in Miami. And it did really well and I toured it and I was lonely. And I thought, oh, wouldn't it be fun to do this with some other, some other, some other people, some friends? And so that that's a selfish reason was I thought, how can I do this and include a couple other people? Then the other side was that uh, a, a great desire to. I'm a passionate storyteller, and I love listening to other people's stories. Um, I particularly like it as an actor when people perform the different roles, you know, and say, you know, and then mom said, la, 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 la. dad said, you know, so I, I love that. And um, so when I was choosing a topic, I thought about, well, where do I hear some of the best stories? And uh, they were often connected to a holiday. And so I just went with Christmas, you know, it could have been Halloween. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and maybe I will make a Halloween special eventually, but uh, the it, it just happened to be that I chose Christmas. And it was interesting because both of my co-stars and, and, and co-writers, Sandra and Maria, they were in very different places when I approached mm -hmm. them. I thought, who can I balance this show out with? Mm -hmm. And Sandra is a top rate um, uh, um, comedian, comic, um, tours and does really, really well. And I thought, I asked her, and she had just broken up after a 13 year relationship. So she was, uh, she said, I cannot write anything. I'm so in the dark place. And I was like, oh, but this will give you something to do, you know? And her piece came out amazing. It's, it's the linchpin of the show. And then um, Maria, who is a comedic actress, she's in Tacoma FD, and she's actually a, a regular series regular on a new show that's coming out on Amazon that we are not able to, to talk about yet, but it will be out probably next year. Um, she, she said to me, no, I'm not gonna do that because she's a comedic actor. She is used to playing other people and not revealing herself. She's not used to being standing on stage by herself. And she had just done a little bit of stand-up comedy and she thought it was terrifying. And I said, oh my God, Maria, you have to, you have to be part of this. I know your story is gonna really balance our, our, our stories out. And uh, she really resisted, but luckily we both know the same acting coach. 
And I called the acting coach and I said, look, I'm trying to get Maria to commit to this. And my acting coach said, um, oh, I'll, I'm going to talk to her. She's going to do it. <laughs> and I got a call the next day and she said, okay, I'm doing it. But what, what a revelation because she is also amazing and her piece is so riveting and so much fun. And she really, she really, she, I'm so proud of her for someone who said, I can't do that. I can't be on stage by myself. And she kills it every year. She kills it. Can you give us a taste of some of the stories we're going to hear? I mean, I don't want you to give it away. I want you to teach. Yeah, I definitely don't want to give any of it away. I was like, oh, I want to hear more of this. So give us a little bit and then leave us hanging. Oh, gosh. Now, see, you should have prepared me for that because <laughs> uh, I have to be very careful. Almost every single thing we talk about in the show, part of the joy is the surprise of it. You know, like, oh, I never thought about it. What's interesting about the show also is that each of our pieces contains a message that is as I said, everyone can identify with. Maria's piece is about bullying and being bullied at school uh, and her family sticking up for her. Uh, mine is about resenting my parents' culture, which I used to feel a lot of shame about growing up. And then I realized, actually, a lot of people do that. It's a typical sort of teenager mistake of like, why, why can't we just be like the people on TV? <laughs> um, and, then, <laughs> and then Sandra's is about being seen. Sandra, as a child, wanted boy toys, not girl toys. Mm -hmm. And so it's about her struggle to feel seen and hers is very powerful because she has a very cathartic moment with her with her mother and uh, I don't want to give anything away because part of the joy of the show is riding with it as our director often tells audiences this is a roller coaster ride hang on and have fun I think this show will really put everyone in the spirit of things I think so too I mean it doesn't matter where you're from what your culture is what your religion is it doesn't matter it's about being human it's, uh, and it's about realizing that we're all very similar. Well, thank you very much. And th this, this, is, this sounds like the perfect antidote to the- What's holiday. going on? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think, and we all need it. We've all sort of shorted Christmas the last few years, our holidays period in the last few years. And the politics yeah. have been so divisive that it's been difficult for everyone. So I think we should all get along this year. So, Feliz Navidad. Um, yes, and, at least uh, Navidad. A, yes, a little absolutely. bit of kindness goes a long way. So Ben and I saw Anne Juliet at the Stephen Sondheim Theater. It's coming to us from England. It's got music and lyrics by Max Martin and Friends. And it's a book by David West Reed. And it's it's basically uh, Shakespeare and his wife are, are having like um, arguments. And their arguments take the shape of changing Romeo and Juliet. It's like, why does she have to die? Why can't, it's stupid. She's like this young woman, she has her life out of her. No, I don't want that to happen. And so so they kind of argue with who gets, whoever gets the quill gets to tell the story. And also I just, there's a lot of lighting changes and I want to mention this immediately. And they gave me an entire paper to tell me when the flashing lights come Ooh. and at noise everything it's all mapped out for you Ooh. so for people with vertigo seizures or whatever autism it's brilliant I this has never happened before and just before the show started I was like I love this thing so anyway Ben you you go on now a bit so Anne Juliet tells the classic story of Romeo and Juliet portrayed with an alternate ending what would happen if Juliet lived Featuring pop music from the likes of Britney Spears, Ariana Grande, the Backstreet Boys, and Katy Perry, you may be unable to help but dance in your seat. Behind all of these songs is one common denominator, producer and mastermind Max Martin, who is often referred to as the Shakespeare of pop. So you might be able to see <clears throat> what Romeo and Juliet would have to do with pop music based on that. The songs are perfectly woven into the story, unlike other jukebox musicals, and lyrics seamlessly flow into each scene. The show is a perfect mix of Something Rotten and Moulin Rouge, borrowing your kind of wacky, whimsical Shakespearean elements and references with your pop scores 
and feel good musical. The show is all around good fun, laugh out loud funny, and even the joy of the cast is palpable. Stark Sands plays uh, Shakespeare and Betsy Wolf plays Anne Hathaway. She goes, yes, that's my real name. And uh, and when they're arguing about how they want it to end and they argue over who gets the quilt, right? She goes, I want it that way. And he says, no, I want it that way. So clever. But the thing that got me absolutely like falling out of my seat, I have not laughed that hard in forever, was um, that she ends up like, you know, her parents want her to go to a nunnery. And so she flees to Paris with her, her best friends, May and um, April, April, May, July, get it? And because uh, April turns out to be Anne Hathaway, she insinuates herself into the story. And there's another story going on where uh, the father wants his son Francois to get married already or he has to join the army. So it's like these kids have to either marry or join a nunnery or, or go to the army. It's like, oh, please. It's like parents are horrible in this. And um, he anyway, he meets an old flame of his. And so after after they meet, they had they sing, they have this wonderful moment where they sing teenage dream. And it is the funniest thing. Thing you ever saw I, I said I think I said it was with uh Paul Paul Otsat and Laura not Laura is it oh no Melanie LaBerry oh that was wonderful and Laura Lorna Courtney is is Juliet and um Justin Ben Jackson Walker is Romeo and you have Philip Arroyo and Justin David Sullivan in it as well and I just, oh, this was just so much fun. I mean, there were puns and sh like you said, Shakespeare references and you had no idea where it was going and you just had so much, you just enjoyed yourself immensely. And the other element of the show that is awesome is it's a feminist retelling of the story. Um, it takes the little known Anne Hathaway, Shakespeare's wife. Again, there's very little uh, historical references of her beyond some legal documentation. Uh, so it's nice to be able to see her be placed front and center in this story. Yeah, and, and we should say we saw the understudy for May. You couldn't even tell it was an understudy. I mean, I thought he was the person who was really supposed to be in it because he was so incredible in it. I just wish they'd given May better costumes. I mean, they were so unflattering and he was so, she, they were just so gorgeous. It's like, come on, dress this person better. Anyway, I'm giving this one a major happy face. Happy face plus. Bina and I got to go to Sardis for a very special event called Encore Ovation, a celebration of aging through the arts. It was an evening of live performance and visual art featuring Encore's members along with a cocktail reception award ceremony. It's hosted by Encore Community Services, a nonprofit organization that provides care and service to the elderly in the Clinton Times Square Midtown community. But the most important thing of all is I discovered that um, Paul Lucas's husband is involved and Paul Lucas died a year or so ago. Uh, he was wonderful. He, he he was wonderful to high drama. We absolutely adored him. He was just the most special person in the world. So to find out an award was named for him and that he was involved in this, it just made me close to Paul Lucas again. I also talked to um Michael Colby. He he Michael Colby was just there, but Michael Colby I know because we're good friends and he's this brilliant lyricist. And Here we are with Michael Colby. And you have something coming up in December at Winter Rhythm. Well, first of all, I'm here because I wrote a book, The Algonquin Kid, and Steve Ross opened the Oak Room at The Algonquin. And I have a great affinity for Steve, and I'm just, I just want to love seeing him honored. Now, my event, which is um, December 11th and 13th um, at Winter Rhythms, the acclaimed series at Urban Stages, it's called Other Lives. It's an evening of the story songs of Michael Colby with um, such people as Sarah Rice, who was the original Joanna and Sweeney Todd, and uh, Stephen Bogardis, who was the original Wizard in Falsettos, and uh, great performers like Clea Blackhurst, who's like the new Ethel Merman. And I have a lot of up-and-comers, too, um, like Joshua Turchin, who um, was the only teenager 
an, an original edition of Forbidden Broadway. And uh, he was, I've also been doing episodes of Mrs. Maisel as a background person. Um, and uh, Joshua was the bar mitzvah boy, Akiva, on, uh, uh, and his rabbi on the show, um, uh, Stuart Zagnet is also doing a song. And I have Tony Emmy winners who are my composers and just a host of incredibly talented people. And each one has a moment to shine. And this came out of the COVID um, hiatus that people approach me about uh, material for when we reemerge. And that's what this is all about having everybody in a resurgence. I know this is this is Thanksgiving and, 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 and Christmas time, but it's, it's sort of like Easter and that we're all coming back. <laughs> well, I can't wait to see it. Thank you. So our next show is December 17th. And once again, a lot of shows that I'm seeing have fallen through the cracks. So it's best to go to the Facebook page and see the reviews there because we're seeing all these shows and you can see what we had to say. So Boswell, um, at 59 East 59th Street is a famous chronicler of Samuel Johnson, and that ends December 4th. Also at 59 East 59th Street is the journey of jazz with the Anderson Brothers back, and that goes till December 11th, while Ye Bear and Ye Cubs will go on till December 23rd at 59 East 59th Street. And they're doing a pantomime called Peter Pan Sexual, so it's a very raunchy pantomime. You Will Get Sick at the Laura Pell's has Linda Lavin in it. And A Rat Trap by Noel Coward, the Mint Theater is doing. And Classic Stage Company is doing one of my all-time favorite musicals, A Man of No Importance with Jim Parsons. It's a Terrence McNally and Aaron's and Flaherty musical. And it's based on this uh, this bus driver in, um, in uh, Ireland. And he puts together theater and he's doing Salome in a church but he's also secretly gay and in love with his uh a bus guy on the bus with him and it's all story about that and his sister wanting to get married but she can't get married till her brother gets married it's just the most wonderful musical I love it and Pam Siegfried is going on at second stage so there is tons of stuff going on. I don't know how I'm going to see anything. There's like 10 Broadway shows opening up. So really, December, forget the movies, go to the theater. Mm -hmm. 